today. What, what kind of writing has changed the world and what kind of writing can change the world? Mm -hmm. um, it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. It's a big topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it is. So let me just take like seven minutes to read two things. One, an old example of a piece of writing that I think did change the world, and the other, a piece of new writing, more recent writing, that may yet change the world. Mm -hmm. And and I just kind of wanted to give the conversation some a starting point mm -hmm. with with these. So this is my very dog-eared copy of *The Origin of Species*, mm -hmm. and I just want to read the last paragraph mm -hmm. of *The Origin of Species* uh, because I think it is. This is a doubtless a book that changed the world in the sense that it changed the way people think about themselves and and their government and their religion and had lots of implications. Uh, so this is the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. And I, so before, before I read this, I, one thing that's striking about it is what a piece of writing it is. So this is science, right? But it's science in 18, so 1859, and then this is the last edition, so 1865, I think, or 1872, last edition. Um, it's, it's so literary and poetic, uh, and that's just sort of something to attend to. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank. Really slow enough. Okay. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent upon each other, in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. These laws, taken in the largest sense, being growth and reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, mm -hmm. variability, a ratio of increase, he means population growth, so high as to lead to a struggle for life, and as a consequence to natural selection, entailing divergence of character and the extinction of less improved forms. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely, the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been, and are being, evolved. <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's unbelievable. I mean, and this guy's like the founder of evolutionary biology. He doesn't sound like... He, boy, is he. I mean, I don't, we can't write sentences like that anymore. The Victorians really have it on us. Um, and how many it sentences is, was that? Like two? Maybe? Yeah, something yeah. like that. It's and, and it's there's so much going on. There's mm -hmm. so much going on that and it's, mm -hmm. I mean, from a literary point of view, just in the in the music of the language, but also rhetorically, I mean, he's thinking about his audience worrying about their god. Mm -hmm. He has an audience that that is is a deistic mm -hmm. group, and he is mm -hmm. telling them. Your God didn't do all this. I mean, the alternative to him at this point is natural theology, which views every organism as a perfectly created, splendid example of mm -hmm. the higher intelligence's um, perfection. Mm -hmm. So he's taking that away. And so he's, he's so sensitive to the fact that he's taking that away in this passage, mm -hmm. in that he, you know, he, he makes space for the creator. He talks about the creator. Mm -hmm. And then he says... There's grandeur in this view of life. Like, don't worry, your, your nature is still extraordinary and spectacular. So there's so much going on rhetorically in that. And so I wanted to read this, and then I wanted to read, as juxtaposition, the abstract of um, the Journal of the Atmospheric Science, a paper in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences from May of 1967 which is sort of the consensus most important paper 
scientific paper in the uh, understanding of climate change. Hmm. 67. 67. I mean, the theory <coughs> that the theory is from the late 19th century, Arrhenius, the uh, uh, the idea that carbon increased carbon dioxide is going to globe the world, warm the world, is is, is late 19th century. But um, if you ask cli a group asks climate scientists to list the most important papers, the seminal papers in the understanding of climate change, and this was number one. Um, Almost universally, this was number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, tied for number two in the number of num first place votes, was um, a paper by Keeling, who I al and I almost did that one just because um, Charles Keeling's daughter lives in town uh, and uh, is a piano a pianist in in Boulder. I almost grabbed that one just for local interest. But so this is the paper that people, all scientists agree, this is, the, this is the most important paper in climate change. It's called Thermal Equilibrium of the Atmosphere with a Given Distribution of Relative Humidity. <laughs> Radiative convective equilibrium of the atmosphere with a given distribution of relative humidity is computed as the asymptotic state of an initial value problem. The results show that it takes almost twice as long to reach the state of radiative convective equilibrium for the atmosphere with a given distribution of relative humidity than for the atmosphere with a given distribution of absolute humidity. What does this mean? Uh, I, that's kind of the point. So yeah. let me... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Also, the surface equilibrium temperature of the former is almost twice as sensitive to change of various factors such as solar constant, CO2 content, O2 content, and cloudiness than that of the latter due to the adjustment of water vapor content to the temperature variation of the atmosphere. According to our estimate, a doubling of the CO2 content in the atmosphere has the effect of raising the temperature of the atmosphere, whose relative humidity is fixed, by about 2 degrees Celsius. Our model does not have the extreme sensitivity of atmospheric temperature to changes of CO2 content, which was adduced by Muller. So... I have a comment for that. Yes. <laughs> Very, like, a, a place in history, because in the um, 70s, before I wrote for the National Desk of the Washington Post, I was hired by uh, Siri, uh, it's now called NREL, the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, and I would go in on assignment as a consultant, as a writer, and they would hand me a, a stack of documents like that, they're about a foot high, at, from a particular author <laughs> group, and they say, please give us a 500 word column that we can mm -hmm. present in a popular, to a popular audience in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I did that for probably four years, going in, getting my pile, literally, and going through to get the essence. Like you could do, you could take these and you could create your next novel or your next nonfiction, by, but you need enough of them to kind of get the essence because if you read that, you would go crazy. It's like, what are they really trying to say? And I had 500 words to tell a popular audience what that really meant. Yeah, there's the right. That was I a mean, job. It is, it is not the fault of Siukuro Manabe and Richard Weatherhold that this is incomprehensible to us. This is a mature science. That, that was a new science when Darwin was writing. Conventions of the scientific discipline are completely different. So they're doing what they're supposed to do as scientists. But it does sort of highlight the problem that the... Um, formative text of evolutionary biology is comprehensible to us and compelling. And it's not surprising that it reached out into a broader social circle and changed the way people think. While the foundational text of climate change is, has, has zero popular potential. Mm -hmm. Zero. Mm -hmm. Doris Lessing wrote a novel called Dawn and Mara. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, I do, I'm, yeah. So you remember she's talking about the drying up the land and the water going toward the poles, so all the migrations are towards the poles. And she did it at least 20 years ago. Right. Right. So. And hardly anybody's heard of it. Yeah, that's so the question. The again is Dawn and Mara. Dawn and Mara. M A R A. M A R A. Their names. That's the, so, that to me is really an, an interesting question. Why? Or what, what sort of writing has it in it now to make a difference on an issue of, at that scale? Or is there anything? I mean, another possibility is maybe writing isn't for changing the world. Maybe writing is for... It's for 
convincing their own professional school. I don't think they write for the common person. Mm -hmm. I, I really mean that. What you just described <coughs> there is so um, symptomatic of almost any PhD thesis or whatever. I mean, that's my favorite essay of all time, 1946, Orwell's discussion about the misuse of the English language, the confusion mm -hmm. aspect of it, but yep. that, that was in the context of politics mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. or changing. Mm -hmm. but the same thing here, it's, 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 it's almost uh, incestuous, mm -hmm. the writing. Mm -hmm. when, when the language is wielded in such a way that it self-selects its audience, yes. then there's absolutely no potential for points of expansion or for the writing to surprise you. You've already chosen who you're going to speak to, how you want them to encounter that material, and what you want them to do with it. Exactly. Uh, and then there there can't be potential for revolution in that because it's completely controlled. And, completely and, so controlled. and who's the intermediary? I mean, you are given the job <laughs> of being the intermediary. And can that be done in the 500 word summary of this paper? I, it, I don't want to be hopeless about this, mm -hmm. but nobody's heard of Don and Mara. It, and and, and the, the, this paper was in 1967, the idea originated in 1898 or so. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what are the attributes of the new kind of writing that's going to that's going to make this have the emotional resonance and kind of poetic impact of, of this. One thought, <clears throat> and it goes back to the Constitution, um, or, you know, Abraham Lincoln and so forth, uh, 1776, before. And um, I had a thought, I heard something, you know, in terms of the Constitution, we all carry that in our... We don't all, but you know, it's down in a pocket size um, digest right now. Mm -hmm. But what if you took the Constitution, because most of the history has been in the, written by men, and you actually rewrote as a as an exercise, like a community exercise or a classroom exercise, rewrite the Constitution in the voice of a woman to see mm -hmm. whether we can take these important documents and put something in it that actually does whether it's, and that's just one example, but there could be many that are just, you know, in a sense, gamifying, playing with the concept of what happens if you if you write it in a modern context, bringing a balance of voices and that dynamic, so that it becomes more of a game. Mm. It's not, you know, one versus the other, but it's like, what if you gamify mm. um, some of our best historic novels? Or you take *Lure of the Flies* or something. You put, you rewrite it with women in that dynamic synergy with hmm. the male mind. Because science, um, um, Scientific American in their last most recent issue on their cover has, they are basically turning Darwin on, it, on his head and saying it's cooperation. That's truly the basis of human evolution, not um, survival of the fittest. Hmm. And, and I even, when I gave my talk last week, I basically talked about human survival back then was based on human reproduction, which he's indicating in that last paragraph mm -hmm. in Darwin's you know, or, Origin of the Species. But I also posited the question that today human survival is about creating that dynamic synergy for creativity, innovation, and I would say even entrepreneurship. So what does that, what if you had competitions all over the world? You know, I was the first to credit a blogger for the United Nations, by the way, on climate change in 2007, when you were just coming here to see you, I guess. But that, you know, what would it look like if you had a global competition on taking some of these things and creating that dynamic synergy between the male and the female voice in order to create that that energy that comes from releasing those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, voices? When I was talking with um, a couple colleagues about this topic, the, the the topic of what sort of do, do words still have power? Is, are, are there are there words that you could say have the potential now to to change the world? Sorry. That's right. Um, one of them, I, 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 I don't I, I don't know if you guys saw this. I'd suggested that if anybody wanted to, they could bring a, a text. 
that's an old example of something that could change the world and a new example of something that yet might yet change the world. Mm -hmm. And I told these colleagues that, I, that that was the suggestion. And actually one of the um, suggestions of a book that um, is recent and has the potential, has that kind of potential as a book by um, Danielle Allen, who is a uh, political theorist at the, where is she? She's at Harvard now. She was at the Institute for Advanced Study for a long time. And she has reread the Declaration of Independence. So it's a very, it's an example of a very close reading of the Declaration of Independence. Reread or rewrote? Uh, reread and, and sort of offered an example of what it means to, to read a text very closely mm -hmm. and bring your own kind of mm. approach to it. So it's, it's, that's in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it is in that and direction. And that's a, the rewriting or regendering of narratives and characters is something that's quite common in certain literary circles, specifically feminist and queer theory circles. Mm -hmm. Like those are practices that I did in undergraduate during that experience. Okay. Um, which is really fun and you know it's just called queering the text for a, a, like that's generally what it is the text. yes mm -hmm. instead of querying yeah <laughs> yeah so there's la there's and then and then there's also and that laughter Play too. Querying, querying. i think um so <laughs> sure. alexa you were mentioning gamifying something and mm -hmm. i feel like um that point of humor and levity mm -hmm. bringing that into normally heavy historical texts, like that can be a really beautiful access point mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. um, because everyone can feel that somehow. That, mm -hmm. um, and when you, when you do open it up, when you allow for it to be some kind of point of play, um, that's, it's, it's a good point of engagement. It's interesting to me that um, one way forward that comes up kind of naturally is returning to great texts. Yeah. You mentioned great mm -hmm. texts. You, you, mm -hmm. you sort of stuck with the idea of exactly. great text, mm -hmm. texts mm -hmm. as if um, the, 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 the way to, for texts to change the world now is for us to go back to a period when texts had that potential to, mm -hmm. to, 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 change, to change things and, and kind of rewrite them. Uh, it's it's sort of interesting because the alternative that it's sort of that it's setting aside is that <clears throat> new texts are the way to to mm -hmm. the way forward the the way to to change mm -hmm. the world and so it's it's just it, to me it's just an interesting kind of yeah I, I think move. it's a, it's a those have to be simultaneous tracks. Like I, the reason I came to Boulder was actually to do my MFA in writing and poetics at Naropa. And I've done a lot of work um, thinking, well, seeing the ties between poetic practice and also liberation theology and poet as prophet and those kind of similar tracks um, in our roles in society. And the thing that I think that the poet and the prophet both have in common is they have to be incredibly mindful of their past with, firm, with feet set firmly in the present with a vision towards the future. Like that, all of those things have to be simultaneously happening. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be an engagement with past texts while you're creating that future revolution too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, without, you can't have one without the other, I feel. Do, do great books matter enough to people anymore that it makes sense to anchor our new literature or our new attempts of writing that has the potential to change mm -hmm. in ask, them? I would ask it differently. I would say, among the great books or the great literature from our past, which ones would? Mm -hmm. Just don't take them as a totality. Mm -hmm. Start with the Bible. How about <laughs> making the Bible more accessible for a, a reader of the 20th, 1st century? Yeah. I really mean that. You go back to the King James, your eyes glaze over. I mean, people who think they understand exactly what's going on, they're fooling mm -hmm. themselves or others. Mm -hmm. I mean, have a really accessible, readable, using that as an example, the mm -hmm. Bible. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly The New word. English the Bible. Jews have been doing this a long time. That's my favorite, too. <laughs> and then you could, the juxt English you could juxtapose it. I mean, this would be interesting for a novel, or you could juxtapose pose it with a reading at Burning Man in 2017. Ooh. And you actually had, you divide, I mean, I've done things where I take a book, not the Bible, but I've divided them into 10 and 20 pages, and then people basically read it and tell you what they read 
and it becomes its own performance. It's really quite, you read a book in an hour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the Bible still matters to people and the Quran still matters to people. Mm -hmm. And actually, one, what first came to mind when I was trying to think of an old text that changed the world was I, I thought of reading the uh, Sermon on the Mount, that mm -hmm. moment in, in the Bible where you suddenly go from yeah. Old Testament ethics to these crazy, I mean, in the context, crazy new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and then to pin that with Burning Man, have yeah. somebody at Absolutely. Burning Man or a presentation where people actually just, you know, present it mm -hmm. in whatever context comes to them, because that's, that's like the farthest extreme of, of organic transformation happening, I think, on the planet right now. But the question I would ask <coughs> you, is it Steve? Yeah. Um, is, it, it, does the Bible have the conceptual equipment we need now? I mean, certainly it was, it was really important ideas in 1000 BC and for the Old Testament and zero for the New Testament. But does the Bible have something that's re that's, that's, that is what we, we need for, for the, the most urgent problems? It's a good question. I mean, when I say translate, I don't mean just literal translation. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Also, to your point, mm -hmm. yeah, there's certain fundamental matters there that, that are unalterable, but how they're expressed uh, need to be mm -hmm. updated. Mm -hmm. My husband, my late husband and I did a, a nine month series, a weekend a month for nine months, that we called Bible as Primal Myth. Very and the good. first Very one good. that we did was on Genesis. and with all the layering of language and of science. And it was very, that was, it's exactly what you're asking for. It was really well, alive yeah, one and current. The, the top, Rabbi, Thank you, one, one is close to, one, chapter. one is close to that is Joseph Campbell, I think, the power of myth, et cetera. Yeah. 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 He does a pretty good job of explaining the myths in mm -hmm. more current terms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. He was very interesting, he was my, he was my dominant as, as an undergraduate. He was my advisor. Oh, uh, Joseph Campbell. <clears throat> I was very lucky. <laughs> and he was really interested. What, what most people are, are remembering is how interested he was in what things come up similarly in every culture. But he was even more interested in what was different. Mm -hmm. And he pinned the what was different to the physical environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So most creation myths have to do with the appearance of light, but there's, there's a creation myth that has to do with this unbearable light having to be screened by some darkness before people could live. Mm -hmm. So it depends a lot on, on where you started out, Absolutely. which was one of his points. You, you, you just say it's a somewhat different tack, but when we live in a society, it's bumper stickers, it's uh, 44 word tweets. It's uh, slogans, make America great again, or better together, or whatever. And these have tremendous power, and they're very, obviously, brief, succinct. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> how can we um, have the power you know, of what you're all talking about in, in a shorter version? Because that's what we're, you know, we're... Um, Acclimated to Huh? Acclimated to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and it, it sinks in, and you don't have to really, mm -hmm. you know. I don't have a bumper sticker contest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Marty, hey, we do still go to movies, or we still do watch TED Talks, and we still do watch longer things, so a lot of those are bases up, based on writing and so forth, so getting back to something that would be longer than mm -hmm. the 140 character mm -hmm. is, because a whole string of those tweets could potentially become a chapter in something, <laughs> right. or the opening a chapter of every book, or every air, what drives... Yeah, it's got to be catchy. It's be I, I don't know. I'm of two minds about this. Should, whether it's right to um, kind of use that to our advantage, mm -hmm. or, or, or to, uh, to decide that that's is it not part of the solution, but actually part of the problem. <laughs> Well, I don't know which well, side I'm on around. there. Yeah, turn around, so it's not a yeah, but maybe there's something, maybe there's, I mean, if you really are limited to 144 characters, you can only say so much. And, and it could be that what we need to be saying is 
I don't know this, but it could be that what we need to be saying is more complicated than 144 characters can possibly handle. That's so, if you're dealing with the mind, if you're just dealing with a limbic response, mm -hmm. a reptilian right. response, it's a then probably reptilian. Yeah. those short things are what do it. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's an evolution of storytelling and a a new understanding of narrative that's emerging that isn't solely defined by brevity. So there okay. there like there is there's definitely that trend you see and you're mentioning tweets and slogans and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like that is a symptom that's not the actual thing beneath it. Um, and I'm not I don't have really answers to it, but I definitely have seen a shift in storytelling and um, specifically around ideas of climate change, there's an organization called Eco Arts, which um, mm. puts artists in direct collaboration with scientists who are doing climate work and trying to figure out how do we articulate those scientific findings in a way that people can experience them. And so that's a visual and sometimes performative element, but it's a way of telling the narrative. And so there's, I think there are these opportunities for collaboration. And you were mentioning movies too, where maybe it's not necessarily the narrative on the page, but it's still some kind of creative storytelling that can happen. That's available can, to the public. I can give you a direct example where this actually came together, technology and storytelling. <clears throat> I was, um, I founded a company in 95 at the launch of the, what we know as the internet public face called VoteLink to vote, link your vote to a cause, VoteLink.com. And, um, and, and I ran it in 2007. I was hired by the city of Des Moines, Iowa. I was doing these community energy futures planning conferences in person where we went and people worked and facilitated. But there I actually used our technology and I went and I, uh, they, I went and we had this day and a half conference where people came physically. And then on our vote link system, I, uh, with the mayor's agreement, I opened it up to the entire city of Des Moines and all their residents to tell a story about their future. And I, we sort of shared some of the ideas that were coming, the visioning that was coming out of these people who, who spent a day and a half. Mm -hmm. So they created the ideas, and then we asked the community to tell the story. And then we would give a, a prize of 500 given by the mayor and a check from the city. Mm -hmm. The first sentence so was a community-wide um, story competition and you talk about changing the world, that changed one community. Mm -hmm. They had the most fanciful, incredible things. Oh, I also did it, sorry, I did it online with Nederland, the town above us. The same thing, because I was doing that in the same year. I had a, a small town modeling how to do that on the internet. And then the, then the community would come in and vote on the story. So it was, it was no judging other than the community itself. I mean, in Nederland above us, the town west of Boulder had you know, mounted policemen on horseback, and they had taking all the pine needles and they turned it into industries, but they told stories around what life in that community, like the day in the life of the town of Nederland or the day in the life of the community of Des Moines. And in those stories, they became very fanciful and then the community voted on them. And mm -hmm. we got pictures from the paper and people got money. And mm -hmm. it was very, it involved creative thinking at a at broad scale. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could, Spark something like that off at the Jaipur Literary Festival that's coming for Boulder? Sure, if somebody asks me and gives me enough time, <clears throat> I'd be it's happy to. It's happening in 10 days, I think, or something like yeah. that. It's yeah. happening in 10 days. In the Why don't we talk a little bit, because, you know, I, I'm online now. We actually do, we have accredited training based on the female brain, but it's male and female. Um, leadership. We actually have online training and discussions. We could do something and repurpose one of our discussions as simply for that storytelling. But we need to tell, you know, I can respond like that because I've already got the technology online and we're already doing it and I just repurpose or just create a new course called whatever that is, storytelling. And yeah, so how do you, how would you, what kind of a vision do you have? I yeah. don't. I just had a split idea. <laughs> the vision hasn't come yet. Give me a we minute. We have to collaborate okay, on it. I think the, the program is set in stone, as I recall. Oh, in terms yeah. of panelists, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, um, but if you just have nothing but literature out, you know, uh -huh. with, with a website. Uh -huh. it, um, it's interesting mm -hmm. to bring up the Jaipur Literature Festival uh -huh. because um, it it's, feels to me like that's a, an event in which the... Um, the, the premise is that st storytelling is a means uh, to important political or social change. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what 
it looks to me like an organizing yeah, principle. Yeah, there's going to be music and other poetry and so forth. And yes. Just, you know, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's an intriguing idea, but it, and it also relates to what you were saying that different places have different creation myths. That's, that diversity is sort of a challenge when you're talking about global problems because yeah. you have to find narratives, stories, myths that that go through. That go through yeah, exactly. That cross. Ex really deep anthropological differences. Mm -hmm. So uh, having a group of people here from India talking about stories and global problems feels to me like kind of a hopeful example of, of that. I'm, have you seen that program? I'm participating in a conversation there. Um, on, on, and, and it, interestingly, I mean in relation to this conversation, interestingly, that the, the, the abstract for, for the conversation, which is about environmental problems mm -hmm. and possibilities of change at a large scale, the, the abstract that I received is largely about institutional change. You know, change at, in institutional, political institutions, large organizations, that sort of thing. Right. And, it, you know, I wonder... That's that's such a different level of resolution than than storytelling, mm -hmm. and the, the sort of thing that we've been talking about, uh, you know, new forms of storytelling or tweets, mm -hmm. yeah. the the right kind of of um, of writing that I that I I've been trying to think a little bit about how those interact. You know, how how do, how does the storytelling interact with the inst the institution, the Paris Acclim Paris Climate Accords, mm -hmm. which have just you know been signed by the two most relevant parties are anything but <laughs> like works of literature. You know, they are yeah. disastrous, bureaucratic, <laughs> thick, I mean, thick, thick political agreements. So, so you know, how we get our stories working at that level, the institutional level, mm -hmm. is, is I think an important challenge. What, do you intend to change the focus somewhat then in your part, part participation? I don't, I don't, I was talking with Patty Limerick, the historian about this, and um, she really strongly believes that um, ambition is kind of the enemy of change. <laughs> That is, mm -hmm. uh, excessive ambition is the enemy of change. Yeah. She really believes that you have to think on much smaller scales, much more approachable problems. So that the very idea that you should think about whether writing can change the world is to her misdirected. That is, don't worry about it. Just figure out what you're going to work on and work on it. Right. I don't know. I don't know because we've all been doing that and actually we've all kind of offered our favorite examples of an, a, a novel or, a, or an event or an institution that has the potential for change. But I don't know that that approach is up to the, pro, to the, to, to the urgency and scale of the problem. Yeah. So here, here's another suggestion because I deal with, my current work deals with evolutionary psychology. You know, that's one big part of it. You know, in cultural and physical anthropology, etc. There's about 12 sciences. But um, that concept of uh, evolutionary psychology and the anthropology there, they cut across all cultures, you know, all ages, all cultures, all countries. And um, so if you actually do something and you, and you choose um, something that's psychological, like um, we are, you know, our world is interconnected. The internet has connected us. So like it or not, you know, we are cross-cultural. You know, we, it's volatile, it's interconnected, you know, and um, that's, it's networked. So we are talking about literature for a networked world that's cross-cultural and interconnected. And so again, with that, um, the the upcoming literary festival in mind in your uh, talk, you know, put a challenge out there to like take some evolution with some psych, uh, some like that. Take the issue of the dynamic synergy, and you know, what is that? What is that new relationship? Let's say it's not based on reproduction anymore. Let's say it's based on innovation bring people together and have conversations about what they would... Uh, in my talk, I talk about parenting technology, and I say, you know, is it authentic or truthful? Is it necessary? You know, is it beneficial to all? And so creating a different narrative around parenting, not children, but parenting technology. Mm. And, mm. And, and that could be an incredibly interesting cross-cultural conversation that could generate, you know, people coming upon each other and on their travels, and it's not about hooking up and what we think sexually, it's really about we're going to create something and that's going to be very social, you know, it's a socially responsible mm -hmm. 
child that we create. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a new paradigm. With a view to, to, to that conversation and, and coming up with hopeful examples of the sort of, the best kind of change spark. examples, I'd love to kind of just end with by soliciting some ideas, examples of your most our, our most kind of hopeful fo points for um, writing that will move the uh, the needle on a, on a large issue. Are we going to get to hear more of your writing before the end? I didn't bring I didn't actually bring any of my writing. <laughs> Although I, I I sent you mm -hmm. uh, I sent you something which I could easily pull up. Yeah. Uh, and read if you would like to hear some right, actual right. words. Hmm? Do, you, do you want me to go print it? Or? It's all right. I can okay. I can just pull it up. Okay, great. But 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 before, I need some ideas first. Yeah, it's a trade. It's a trade. <laughs> Hopeful example. That whole social that impact. That sure, writing about. writing that it could have an impact at a, at, on an issue at a large scale. Writing that could have an impact on a large scale. Okay. This whole concept of thinking together for the common good, I mean, the whole basis of, you know, that change is thinking together for the common good. And you're without boundaries, you're without borders. So what is your medium? You've got the internet, you've got communities are connected, you've got people who have a... You're going to pull up something right here, but it's sharing with this group. We don't, we're not sitting here with our computers, but you've got a phone or device. Mm -hmm. That idea of thinking together for the common good and tell, the stories that come out of that will become, to me, the next genre, the next literature. Hmm. Because, it, um, I mean, I have family in Africa who are creating immense, a 25-year-old granddaughter creating immense, you know, water solutions using plants. And there's whole, her whole life meeting with presidents, 25-year-old, you know, dancing with diplomats, etc., but it's all in the cause of a social good. Mm. You know, I've been in Bali where, you know, they're either running away from a problem or searching for a solution. They're all searching for meaning. They're all search searching for passion and purpose. And those become great storylines, who they meet along the way, the person who wants to fall in love and settle down and have children versus the person who's going to help you design the next, you know, streamline product or some technology. It's a, it's the technology and the innovations and the ideas and mm. that's why I used Burning Man earlier as an example because it's not really, they burn everything or they walk away but it's, there's so much creativity that sparked in that one week and then it all blows away or burns up. <clears throat> Burning Man. It's your example. I like, Ellie? Do, oh, go ahead. I like your idea that, I mean, my ear picked up what I wanted to, of course. And that is, I think, stories work better than diatribes. Mm -hmm. That fiction, mm. mythic fiction, really works beautifully. But to get to that level of depth, you can't just think about it. So I would want to get together a group of, say, six, five or six people who are willing to sleep over and do some dream incubation together and then write mm. and see what we come up with. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you both think of collective writing. Well, I do my own writing, but it's, you know, I have yeah. uh -huh. my limits of taste uh -huh. and where I think, and somebody else is going to think outside those boxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we induce and dream together and then get up and before we say a word to each other, write, write the dreams or write what we wish we had dreamed if we couldn't remember a dream, mm -hmm and do our own stuff and then share it, mm -hmm. yeah. then, we, then we get some juice. We, we get to inspire feminine. each other. That's, uh, that reminds it's me there's, the a, feminine too, that principle. there's a really fantastic poet <coughs> based in Denver named Matthias Felina. And he actually does a project where you can subscribe to, the, it's normally for a season, and he will write your dreams for you. And he sends them to you in an envelope, and so you go and you get your mail, and there's a page of poetic in, of a dream that, and then you woke up today, and this was your dream, um, and that's in, and of course I'm biased. If you ask what kind of writing is changing the world, I think of those poetic gestures that are shifting a frequency in a very subtle and personal 
offering, you mm -hmm. know, but but those, that feels really potent to but me. Because um, Pablo Neruda the... wrote one, remember, for one day let everything be silent. Mm -hmm. It's an, a, a brilliant poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for some, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to become the literature, but it becomes the catalyst for mm -hmm. someone like yourself to peruse that and, and create your your literature out of the sparks that are, mm -hmm. you know, kindling that fire. Yeah. The things that you're talking about are, um, th they're, they're syntheses of, mm -hmm. of input from multiple people that this guy does? Well, he, he just writes your dream for you, which I think is like I this see. hilarious egotistical thing to do, which is fantastic, <laughs> you know, because that feeds one part of the poet persona. But mm -hmm. he, he just, he writes your dreams for you. So wow. you say you, so it's like, it's, I mean, normally the price of paying for a book, but what you get is personalized dreams yeah. that he sends you don't tell to you in the mail. You don't tell him anything. Okay. And so you just go get the mail, and then it's last night you dreamed you were flying somewhere, and you <laughs> saw this person, and then, huh. and it's and it's really fantastic because in that moment, that person all is having that dream somehow. It's just this, I think it's brilliant. Um, so there's that, and there's also a lot of really powerful, I think, social activist poetry happening locally, but that is entrenched in like a lot of language of magic and mythos, which makes it, I think, really acceptable, or uh -huh. um, accessible. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. and um, that's another writer, Sila Satterstrom, who's also in Denver. Um, she's actually the director of the CU um, Creative Writing School, or the DU Creative Writing School right now. And she has a wonderful book called Slab, um, which is a lot about New Orleans and growing up in the deep south. And she has these, you know, really incredible images of the water will never not be here in terms of the flood. Like that way will always be there, even when things are repaired. And it's just, I don't know, that, that kind of writing seem, it, it, there's a lot of pain mm -hmm. to it, but it seems very hopeful mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's another whole thing here that I don't think quite fits, but the role of music. Mm -hmm. And um, we recently had a couple hours with Michael Fitzpatrick, the so called the Buddhist uh, um, this cellist, uh, mm -hmm. um, Dalai Lama's cellist. Anyway, and we were talking about the role of music, and of course, he's committed to that. And he's going to be doing an event in Aspen next year, um, globally telecast and so forth. And then he posted on, we're friends on Facebook, he posted um, the song Imagine, Imagine, all these good things. The Beatles Imagine. Huh? The Beatles Imagine. Yeah, the Beatles Imagine. And they actually, the, the post that he put up, and I reposted, it was on um, John Lennon, who's actually singing as he's walking through Central Park. And it is so moving. And, and so, again, the role of music, of course, is words, but uh, in a different form. And um, you think, you know, Ar Arlo Guthrie or whoever, I mean, you can folk music a lot also, you know. So to me, that's um, another medium that uh, can affect social change in a um, mm -hmm. effective and pleasant and non-confrontational. It slips right in. It slips right in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Spoken like a writer there. Spoken you know, like a singer. Singer, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. She's a singer, so she's you know tuned into the music thing. But I just want to throw that in the yeah. mix here while we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Laura Esquivel did something that I've, I only saw her do. I don't know if there are more, but she published a book with a CD of the music that she referred to throughout the book, in uh -huh. the back of the book. That's great. Uh -huh. Which is an idea I'm passing on to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. You want to throw something in, Steve? Find something and I say it. But nothing relevant, incremental, important to add right now. Okay. That's hard to believe. So the gift of, gift of silence. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I hadn't expected this, the, the uh, idea that um, from 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 this kind of what what seems feels to me like noise sometimes mm -hmm. this abundance of different um, messages and little bits and and uh, small personal narratives th you all have a confidence that from that will emerge a kind of 
myth or, 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 or form of storytelling that will be, that will be powerful. It's an ecology. I mean, in a sense, you think of an ecology, and unless you want to micro focus on one plant or one flatworm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you want to paint the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll go ahead and read something. Uh, <laughs> though I hadn't planned to, I didn't even bring my book, so uh, I am going to pull up when when um, telling our way to the. The first book was called Telling Our Way to the Sea, and when Telling Our Way to the Sea came out, the publisher, FSG, produced this little chapbook, which was just an excerpt from the last chapter, uh, and printed it, and but also created a PDF version, and I had sent that to Ellie, so that's the reason I have some hope of finding it right now. <laughs> so this is actually the beginning of the last chapter, and uh, the book... Um, the book is about this group of students that I've taken to the Sea of Cortez. And uh, we, this particular year, we um, were there for an enormous hurricane. Uh, and it kind of crept up on us and we didn't have time to get out. And so that provided a terrific plot <laughs> for me. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the last chapter. At daybreak... Fiery light pierced the folds of gray, the faded silver sky, the drifting tatters of fog, the mist rising off the bay, and struck our faces for the first time in four days. The desert steamed like a newborn landscape. The Cardon and Sirio looked clean and alive. Every spine pricked a tiny droplet quivering with light. It was, it was as if we blinked awake just in time to catch the sea being separated from the sky the earth from the sea. Our group is giddy with the world's freshness. As Veronica and I swing the pongas from Sammy's boat ramp to the station beach, we carve needless curves in the placid water, as if to announce, in giant calligraphy, our presence after the flood. The hurricane is over, and we are still here. The students spill from the terrace down to the beach like a clan of wild and hooting street urchins. Rafe is wearing his sarong as a cape, <laughs> Anoop has a pair of Miles's mirrored race goggles around his forehead like a headband. Cameron and Allie are both coated in wet sand because the two of them have been heaping up an enormous pile which they say they are going to sculpt into a totem of the fin whale. As Ace, Miles, and Cameron climb into the bow of my boat, I notice that Haley has already joined Veronica. It's the first day she's not in the same panga as Ace, though I have no idea if the move is meaningful. Graham, standing on the beach, looks back and forth between the pongas as though someone, something's amiss. And then I realize, Becca's not here. When I ask the students about it, Ace replies, she said she's too tired. He manages to say it without sounding joyful, but of course the group's uncorked spirits may have something to do with her absence. I glance at Allie and Lucy, who have seated themselves behind me, and Allie shrugs and nods as if to say, it's true, that's all there is to it, she's tired. She's had a rough couple of days, I say, but stop there, feeling that the enumeration of details, the shark, the fall in the turtle tank, digging ditches with the rest of us, will somehow come across as mean-spirited. Allie nods. Even in her, I think, there is a hint of relief, if also a sad resignation. At last, a day without Becca's stories. But yes, we have failed as a group. Across the short span of shoreline between the Sea Eagle and the Cortez Angel, Veronica and I look at each other, and I make a gesture like I'm counting off the students in my boat. She winces and nods a grim acknowledgement. Then I nod, too. We both know we should go check on her, talk with her, before we embark and we've both decided against it. Hop on, Graham, Veronica says. Throttles open, hulls planing weightlessly, we make for the sand spit. From there, we'll veer north toward the volcano because we've decided to search for the fin whales. On this first steaming morning after the flood, the image of Leviathan lunge feeding beneath a cinder cone seems irresistibly primeval. It's as if the lifting of the mist has awakened in us some atavistic urge to pursue our greatest of queries. Our plan, then, is for Veronica to take the Sea Eagle clockwise around Coronado while I take the Angel counterclockwise. We'll meet somewhere on the northern side, and, we hope, one boat will have located the whales. We round the sand spit in parallel, my own boat closer to the verge, where the still water looks greenish over the plunging slope of sand. The beach appears exceptionally pristine this morning, scoured by the rain and the surf, and for some reason abandoned by its usual row of malingering pelicans and gulls. I throttle down and swerve right, crossing Veronica's wake. 
because from here our Panga paths will diverge. Ordinarily, we wouldn't separate, but the day is blissfully calm and we are eager to cover more territory, determined to find our whales. Having cleared Ventana Reef, I steer for a cloud of birds hovering in front of Piojo, only slightly off our appointed course. And as we approach, I ease the bow down and kill the engine, so we can watch and hear the feeding frenzy. A patch of water seethes where a shoal of silvery grunion are pressed to the surface by a murderous pack of predators. I've already seen brief flashes of yellowtail and skipjack, and the birds have gathered overhead to feast on the panicked throng. Attacked from above and below, the grunions swarm and writhe like eels, catching the sunlight on their sides and frothing the sea into an emulsion of white foam, shattered mirror, and fish blood. The ceaseless roar of a waterfall is punctuated by the percussion of a shooting range. Pop, 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 as boobies dive bomb the shoal from high above. Folding their wings, they plunge fast, puncture the mayhem heedlessly. Meanwhile, the pelicans belly flop clumsily into the thick of things and come up with their gullets full of salt water. One smacks down face first right beside our boat. As he lifts his head, the sea drools from the sides of his beak and the membranous double chin deflates, revealing within it the wriggling shape of a fish. For a second, the bird looks disconcerted, stricken with a swollen and spastic epiglottis, but then he tilts his head gluttonously back and ends the struggle with a single hard swallow. Behind the crisscrossing paths of bird missiles, through the fishy mist that rises from the froth, I see now a distant row of quick, misty spouts peppering the surface. Bottlenose, the first pod we've seen. As we head toward them, they rocket from the sea in boisterous spirals. The students cheer loudly, and the dolphins respond with even wilder antics. For them, too, it appears, the morning feels bracingly new. Behind their acrobatics, as if on cue, a pair of whale spouts rise. One towering, the other low, a mother and her calf. We circle round the bottlenose to head for the spouts, and the dolphins fall in behind our boat, as if they regret losing our attention. Are you there? says Veronica's voice. And before I can pick up the radio, she repeats herself, are you there? And my heart tightens, because her timing is off, too quick, and something must be wrong. You okay? I ask. We're with a cetacean I've never seen before. What do you mean? Much bigger than a bottlenose, high black dorsal, rounded head, but not as round as a pilot whale, and there are about 30 of them. She's trying to be calm and clear, but there's a slight tremble in her voice. In 15 years on these waters, Veronica has seen many species, even transient orcas, but never something she could not identify. Never a creature whose diagnostic traits and Latin name were not memorized years ago by a young Czech girl doting over the soft, worn pages of the Audubon Society's Guide to Marine Mammals of the World. We peel away from the whale spouts and fly north. Veronica must have already made it around to the eastern side of the volcano. Otherwise, the radio wouldn't work. And sure enough, seconds later, there is her panga, a small white dot on the horizon. And between it and us, something is breaking the water, a wide traveling front. If I had not just heard from Veronica, I might have thought common dolphins just because of the way the pod is arranged in a broad phalanx. Or I, or I might not have, because the black back stitching the surface, rising, gleaming, descending, and rising again, are just too big to be dolphins. Now that we are coming closer, I can see that the front is moving in the same direction we are, toward Veronica's distant panga. And why, but why, I wonder, is she so far away? Why isn't she with them? Running full bore, veering slightly eastward so as not to cut their ph phalanx in its middle, we pull even, even with the traveling front. Then I back off the throttle, and we peer down the length of their row. They are just as Veronica described, twice the size of bottlenose, coal black and fusiform, powerful and fast. Moving with them like this, it feels almost as if we've joined their pack, as if we are one among the sea wolves. I pull a quarter mile ahead and cut my engine so that we'll be, we will be able to listen to them breathing as they pass. I'm going to stop. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to sell books here. <laughs> well, you're doing a good job. Kept you at CU, like you can't leave. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's like Stephen Gould and, and maybe more. Thank you very it's much. Really That's great. very sweet. Yeah, thank really you very much. What is the book called? The book is called Telling Our Way to the Sea. Because it's about, yeah. well, it's about what we've been talking about. It's about storytelling. It's thrilling. And how that might get you into a place and how it might uh, be an element of some kind of solution to bigger challenges we how face. Many drafts 
did you do to prepare for that final? I mean, you don't just write like that, right? No. <laughs> so how many drafts? Um, so my own, my own attempts, it takes me yeah. a number of drafts to get where I want to get. Yeah, this, this section was probably rewritten five to ten times, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, but of course, each writing is kind of in itself many multi rewriting, mini rewritings, you know? Right. Because you're kind of writing, reading, writing, reading, writing, reading. But, but in terms of like how many times I printed it, <laughs> I'd say five to ten. I don't know which because the different parts of the book took different numbers of drafts. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really I mean, Thank you. gripping. Thank but you. But then it jumps back to the idea that you said how it seems that you have this penchant or desire to have collaborative, you know, uh, collective writing. Because your earlier question was directed to us in terms of what would change the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes back to that Patty Limerick thing, you know, ambitions, whatever. You've got a great book that should be read. But it's hard to say how many people around the world will read it, but those who do will be given a gift. Mm -hmm. Your gift or your great talent. Mm -hmm. However, if, you're, if your other goal, the meta goal, is to change consciousness or change the world or lift the vibration or whatever, then how do you have to somehow engage people, whatever level they are, in telling their version of what of their experience? So each person, each student, <clears throat> in their journal, probably has a story, and it's not going to be this story, but collectively they are sharing an experience. So the telling of that story as a collective is one part that may catalyze mm -hmm. the genius that you show in your writing to emerge in one spot, but it's the collective that created, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to shift the world, everybody has to find their way to tell the story that's relevant to them from the experience they're experiencing, and then you can lift to mm -hmm. your level. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is, and, and unless they make it into a movie in every single language, I mean, even Lester <laughs> Brown, you know. We're hoping like for planet, that. Yeah, <laughs> planet B, I know. Yeah. It's there, and at the same time, Engaging people. I mean, that is that is really great. Thank you. That all by itself is Thanks. very moving. Thanks. I, I, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. For lunch. Would you mind spending just a couple minutes on the writing program at Stanford? The reason I'm asking is so Tobias Wolf, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure he's an instructor there or a student. Uh, I don't know if he wasn't a student there. He was. He's. Uh, was he actually just retired? But he. Um, was uh, in the creative writing program uh, an instructor? Or Ken Kesey. I mean, there's, there's a whole yeah. wonderful group. Yeah, there is. So could you say a couple minutes about the program? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, I'd be happy to tell you what I know about it. Uh, oh, but I, I, I was, know. when I was there, I was a, bio, I was a PhD oh, I student in biology. Oh, right. However, it was an irresistible distraction. And so I <laughs> did, um, I did sit in on all of, Tobias Wolff's lectures. He oh. taught a course mm -hmm. on the short story yeah. uh, for the English department, not mm -hmm. for the creative writing department. Uh, um, and so I would just go sit in the back and try to look young, <laughs> 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 as if I were a, one of the Stanford undergrads. Um, so uh, it, it does seem like a very special program. Um, the, um, I, it's very small. The way it's, I think the way it's structured now is uh, there are about, the, they do teach some courses for undergrads, but um, each year there are, I think, only something like five or six graduate fellows. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very small group. Mm -hmm. So could you also talk to the concept of experiential learning, because certainly taking them out of the classroom environment into nature, yeah. to talk about nature. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's enormous. So I think what did they do? This is did you so have them writing important. While they, were there? they so in this class we um, looked at a single place that I wrote about from through the lens of about five or six different disciplines, and we'd have visiting, we'd have professors come in, and talk about oceanography, ecology, evolution, geology, whatever we could find to illuminate this particular location. Mm. Um, but I, I actually think that this is um, just vital for, not just for learning biology, but for uh, becoming, but for solving this, for solving environmental problems. And I recently um, 
joined the board of this organization called Ecology Project International, mm -hmm. which um, teaches courses like this for junior high and high school students in eight, about eight special places in, around the world. Well, in the Americas right now, they haven't gone outside North and South America. Um, but what's really extraordinary to me about them is that each class, which is about a three-week field course for, you know, 13 to 16-year-olds or something like that, 12 to 17-year-olds maybe, uh, each class is half kids from the United States who can pay tuition, rich kids mm -hmm. <laughs> from the United States mm -hmm. basically, and half local kids, uh, meaning the kids from the Gal from Ecuador who have never been inside Galapagos National Park mm -hmm. because they can't afford the admission mm -hmm. or kids from Costa Rica who have never been inside Corcovado National Park the truth is those special places are sort of reserved for the wealthy visitors from the developed world and this organization is teaching these classes in 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 these places and it it just the field education makes it feel like the disciplines matter like the, like the intellectual content matters. Mm -hmm. and, and also opens up the places to these kids. So I, I really think it's an important part of Good. the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really do. Oh, and there's an interesting ethical dilemma that might form a crux of another book. I'll just throw it out because it's, it's both the race to save, like the Great Barrier Reef, but then all the people who want to be marketed to saying, this is your last chance to get to see the berry reefs before they become over, right? yeah. you, know, uh, you know, urine, for yeah. example, just the, the human, you know, body um, fluids and so on in yeah. the waters with these sensitive things. So even that, 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 that ethical drive to protect something versus your drive to be the last, this is the last item on my bucket list, this is, I'm the, I want to be the last person to snorkel across this or scuba sure. dive mm-hmm mm -hmm. and the, yeah so I mean, the last you know the more, last scuba diver the more last generally the dilemma that um you know edward abbey wrote about it beautifully in desert solitaire just the the dilemma that loving these places mm -hmm. yeah. can be sort of destructive in itself on balance i you know having well there's an with, example of like a, a book that potentially could have you know, gone around the world, and it did have an impact for its time. And yeah, and a famous phrase from the guy saying, "You mean when he told him you had to turn around with his Cadillac and go back?" He said, "You mean I've got to see the same places twice?" <laughs> yeah, I uh, on balance, I think I'll take the, the the excessive love for a place now, even though he wrote about how dangerous that could be to the national park system. I, I actually think it's excessive clear, that, yeah, that that it's clear that people being more people being more interested in these places mm -hmm. is the only hope oh, yeah. even if they even if they you know stampede and overrun a tenth of it issue mm -hmm. because it is it's that stampede to be the last mm -hmm. to see it especially in sensitive ones like water environments where it's the urn itself people peeing in the water as they swim that's killing off a lot of stuff versus yeah. being on the land but that's so that's a good example actually so ecologically so that is a small problem <laughs> Urine is a small problem relative to acidification and temperature yes, change. Right, exactly. So, but so like that's door. kind of a nice encapsulation of it. Fine, let more people pee in it. But <laughs> if if it means that that collectively you have you you have the political will to achieve lower carbon dioxide emissions and right. because that if it that, transfers if it transfers yeah. if it yeah. transfers you get off the bus and get on a train or etc. Yeah, maybe. Is that know. transfer transfer points? Well, one idea transferred to another. Yeah. Sit up there. Yeah. Interesting. Well, those you can explore those because you've got great writing skills. Thank you very much. Really thanks for amazing. thanks for having me for the conversation. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Enjoyed it. This was wonderful. And I think we've stirred some of our own ideas for future issues too. Mm -hmm. This is great. But so, what's your next? You've got one. So I've got this novel. Can. I've got this novel which I sort of only told you the first half about. Um, and then I'm. I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I think about this problem of individual versus institutional change and whether you really do need to think at the level of... Inst uh, you know, where, where, should, where should one be thinking? Should one be thinking at the level of, of, of individual um, human plights and dramas or should one be thinking at the level of abstract institutions? Well, part of it has to do with 
where your real talents are. Right. There are some people who are really good at thinking in much bigger terms. They may or may not be very good one-on-one, -on -one, and others for whom it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's not only what the need is, it's what your mm -hmm. real the, inclination is. As you said, they were the emotional, like the limbic system gets engaged. I can tell you there's a hidden bias from barrier that institutions will will confront you with. They did actually, Harvard uh, uh, Business Review did a survey of globally looking at corporations and the idea of putting quotas in. Could you make institutional change by quotas? And where they've done it in governments, there's been some measurable success economically and so on, profit-wise. But what happens is the ability to have quotas depends upon your political affiliation. Quotas for? Quota for like women, to make an institutional oh, change, to uh -huh. bring them into balance uh -huh. in the right. boardroom, for example, or in leadership. Right. Uh, if you are liberal, 50% will say, and the board will say, yes, let's do it. Mm. If you're independent as a pers political persuasion, 11% will say, yes, let's do it. And if you're conservative, which a lot of corporations, that's their basis, only 9% will say, let's use this mechanism, even though they know there's proven results, positive proven, only 9% will say, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So organizational change is like the foreign protein. You come in with a creative idea, and it's a foreign protein that's going to be attacked by the immune system called the corporation. And that itself is an interesting, you know, David and Goliath. You've got a foreign protein called, you know, creative innovative idea versus the body. The, the, yeah, the it's going to clear it. Yeah. To yeah. Make it immunologically. <laughs> yeah. Aren't there organisms who disguise themselves as the ones they're going to join? So well, they look well, it's, you perfectly have to find innocuous from the beginning. Well, what you do is you attach yourself nice to a champion, idea. and the champion takes you through the system disguised uh, as, you know, an under undergarment of a champion or mm -hmm. an underarm or underwing, mm -hmm. a wingmate of a champion. Actually, something like 95% of your genome is, um, is defunct virus that integrated itself into your genome. So from that point of view, like we, just, we, we just have to integrate <laughs> ourselves into those organizations.